Hi, my name is Josh Luftig. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of APTV. Today we are speaking with the absolute legend Aaron Carrasco, co-founder of Pino and Picasso, Australia's number one paint and sip experience. Pino and Picasso is a multi-award winning business, including Best New Business and Best Local Business Awards in 2019 and 2020. Aaron, thank you so much for making time to speak with us here today. Not to a problem, with, Josh. Thank you for having us. Uh, absolute pleasure, mate. So to start with, um, how long have paint and sip businesses been around for? What's the industry size and um, how has the industry grown over the time frame? Yeah, really good question. I believe um, in Australia, it's, it's only been in, in the last five years or so, the emergence of this type of a business has come to uh, full fruition. We started in June 2018. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a small niche type uh, offering that we do uh, provide. And I guess since that time, um, we have seen a number of um, other people kind of come up and um, do it, which is, um, which is, is, is pretty cool because it's become quite a um, really well-known thing to do now, as opposed to when we first started, it was completely out there. So, um, which is great. The more people that know, the more opportunities that we have for people to uh, enter our studios. And so how big is the industry at large, both here and overseas internationally? Any idea? Yeah, so yeah, the US market is 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 what we benchmark everything against. Um, it's been there for about ten over ten years, fully tapped out. But there is so many studios um, across there. In terms of other markets, uh, we've currently just gone to New Zealand, um, and Europe seems to be somewhat untapped as well. So I uh, said so a pretty small industry um, that's continually growing, um, and we believe you know we're going to be definitely at the forefront of uh, of, of expanding. Um, I guess the the concept and also the brand in in some untapped markets in both Australia and, and potentially around the world. So from there on, you've continued your journey from 2018 and now you've got 60 locations, is that correct? Yeah, so we uh, obviously this, this COVID lockdown in New South Wales and Victoria has slightly slowed it down a little bit, but there is uh, 60 trading studios and there's a, a much larger pipeline at the helm. Um, we have our first New Zealand studio that's opened um, with a number going through there um, and yeah, we, we, New South Wales is completely tapped out. Victoria is well on their way. And I guess we look at the whole of the, uh, the whole rest of the country. And yeah, we're on a, we're on a really, really lovely uh, growth trajectory at the moment. That's incredible. So in three years, with two of those years pretty much being COVID, how do you manage to scale a business over that short time to grow as quickly as you have, yet to remain as sustainable as you need to in order to continue the growth? And for any of our viewers potentially looking at a franchise model, what are the elements of success in growing as quickly as you have in that sort of way? Every day is just a little bit different. So we don't completely say this is the roadmap or whatever it may be. Um, what we have learned is that when there is times of um, tough, tough periods, such as the first lockdown that happened last year and then what we've just come out of, um, we really see it as a very, very good point to double down investments, um, make marketing heavier, um, invest in the brand a little bit more, invest in personnel, um, all different types of ways that we've done um, and we believe that we've been quite successful through these really heightened periods of um, you know restrictions that when you come out of it you, you see the dividends of it you know much much higher than if you were to kind of um, rest on your laurels a little bit because it was a tough period. Um, but in terms of the franchise model how do you scale such a big business what are the core elements that are required to go from one two or three studios to a massive amount of 60 in a short period of time? Is it all processes? What are the key elements that are required? Yeah, we always say that we're a lifestyle business, which means that we can, um, and, and, and a lot of our people that have invested with the brands, they don't have to necessarily stop their lives. Um, they can comfortably maintain full-time jobs and um, really do, you know, get to not alter their life so radically that, you know, it's all or nothing. So we've, in a, you know, been able to create a really, really um, sound procedure. Um, it looks good. It, it's fun. It can be done. Um, as a side business, um, which eventually turns into a full-time job. Um, so it's an enticing thing for, for investors. Um, I think that lockdown, going back to it, it allowed people to kind of reset and take shape as to what they actually want to do. Um, and I think they found that they were, you know, even the most experienced uh, company people can still be just as vulnerable in their jobs as um, some, you know, others. So I think they wanted to take a lot more um, flexibility in their lives and, and really kind of dictate if something was to go quite wrong. Um, that they're still in control of, of what potentially their futures may be. So these are all things that I, I guess we pr prided ourselves on and being able to pr provide an affordable and profitable business. 
um, which then indirectly has, has allowed uh, you know us to create a bigger pipeline, um, uh, get more um, business owners on board, and and really scale up to to the numbers that you're talking about. What are some of the big either challenges or mistakes that you feel you've made, and what would you do if you could change one big aspect along that journey? We always talk about like failing fast. Um, it's quite a you know common business term really, but fail fast don't look back in anger and, and move on and learn and review and get on with it. So um, in terms of a, a monumental uh, mistake, I think it was um, really, really early days that kind of broke, uh, it was the straw that broke the camel's back for James and I to actually take this um, quite seriously as a full-time job where there was a colossal error um, at our very first studio. And it was one of those moments that we thought, hold on, we're onto something pretty good here. Um, and then something that people, um, you know, may work their whole lives to try and crack. And we've kind of cracked it um, without even realizing. So I think that was one of the, the the great turning points that we said, you know what, let's let's have a real run at this. Um, and this was at studio number one. So um, I think those type of learnings that we did have, um, we didn't toil around for, you know, three years and, and, and put up two or three studios because it worked. We, we, we really kind of dove head first into it to ensure that um, if it was if it was going to be something fantastic, um, but we weren't going to, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda um, miss out on that opportunity. Um, so over the next two years, what growth do you have um, in terms of goals for Pinot and Picasso and how has COVID potentially either affected or, or triggered a different response to those goals? Probably first part is to, to, to lock away all our Australian territories. Um, so we're well on our way to doing that, um, but it's just um, figuring out um, and, and finding the right people to take the remaining territories within the country. Um, then it always just becomes a, a big uh, push on how we can continue to innovate and continue to expand the concept and expand our current um, database and, and give people more than they ever wanted out of Pino and Picasso. Um, so that's probably our first part. The second one is, is, is effectively penetrate um, both the New Zealand and, and UK markets, um, which again, a lot easier said than done, um, but they're, they're, I guess, what's looking in the next 12 to 18 months down the pipeline. Um, and yeah, it's just all about now um, consolidating the brand that we do have and, and, and continuing to be cutting edge and, and that brand that other brands look, look towards and, and and kind of keep them on their toes as well, just thinking, what, what are these guys going to do next? So uh, they're things that, you know, get us bouncing out of bed on a Monday morning. Um, and, and I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. That's really, really exciting. Thanks for painting that picture for us. Um, <laughs> as someone who has relationships with a variety of landlords, what aspects do you see as most important in tenant landlord relationships? And is there a need or a benefit for a head office in a franchise business model to have that direct relationship with the landlord? Or is that something you feel is best left for the landlord and the tenant to navigate? Okay, really good question. Uh, firstly, we, we love retail. We love retail spaces. We love cool little retail spaces. It's, it, it is, um, you know, whilst, you know, a lot of businesses uh, have, have shifted much into the online markets, I think they will always, you know, end up making their way back to retail. Um, bricks and mortar is, is fantastic. In terms of landlord um, relationships, I think I always say context is a really, really, really important thing. Um, it's like any type of relationship. You need to know their backstory just a little bit. You need to know, you know, whether that commercial property that you're looking to, to lease is, um, you know, their superannuation nest egg or, you know, one property in a portfolio that, you know, makes your eyes water or, you know, the, their main source of income or whatever it may be. Um, then once you start to understand that, I think you start to figure out what is going to be a best deal for both the landlord and yourself. Um, like I said, I think there is a great misconception out there that all people that own commercial real estate are moguls that are in Monaco on their yachts. Um, whilst there is some like that, um, for more often than not, you know, it's, it's savvy people that have purchased um, property long, long time ago and it may be, you know, their children's inheritance or whatever it may be. So I think the key is to ensure that both parties are getting somewhat of a, of a fair deal. Um, if, if you try and start a us versus them, um, mentality from the start it's not going to be a good relationship and a short-term win um, in a commercial setting isn't isn't something that you know you should really work towards it's something that you want to see out for the for the duration of the term and hopefully take up any options and renewals and all sorts of stuff like that so um, that's that's probably the advice for a, a landlord relationship in terms of what do you think the if it should be you know conducted by the tenant and the head office I think head office has a, especially at our level has a huge uh, role to play in um in assisting with tenant and landlord relationships, but ultimately it does come down to the tenant. We have uh, used uh, and then used the services of AP to lease some of our properties. I think having a great property manager 
um, a leasing agent is, is, is key as well. Um, but they're both working and then it's quite obvious that they're working for both sides as well um, to, uh, I guess, get that uh, harmonic relationship that we're looking at. Um, but I think that ultimately lies with the tenant and the landlord um, with great assistance from, from the head office company. Aaron, thank you so much for sharing all of those valuable messages, some learnings and insights into, uh, into your incredible business. Not a problem. Thank you very much for having me.